Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And we're going to turn on the Word of God and to see what God's Word has to uh, share with us and to bless us with and we can learn from. So we're going to turn to the New Testament and to the Gospel of Luke, the third book in the New Testament, Luke's Gospel, and go to the very end, which is the last chapter, chapter 24. And when we get to the chapter, we're going almost towards the very end of that chapter, the end of the book. And we're going to commence reading from verse 46. Then Jesus said to them, that is to the disciples, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And it's the last section that we're going to be focusing on at this point. Verse 50. And he, Jesus, led the disciples out as far as Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his precious word to each of us today. You may or may not be aware of it, but this actual coming week is a special day on the Christian calendar. It's not as widely well known or remembered such as Palm Sunday, uh, Resurrection Easter Day, and Pentecost Sunday. But on Thursday, May the 18th, it will be Ascension Day. And you may, you may ask, well, what is Ascension Day? And uh, often say, well, the clue is actually in the name. Ascension. Ascension means to go up. Ascension Day is the celebrating of Christ, the Son of God, ascending into heaven from earth after his death, burial, and resurrection. Ascension Day occurs on the Thursday, 40 days after Resurrection Sunday, Easter. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared several times to his disciples and others over 40 days. The question could be asked, well, how do we know this? In Acts chapter 1, the very beginning of the book of Acts, which the writer of the gospel we've read from this morning, Luke, he also wrote uh, the book of the apostles, the Acts of the apostles. And so, he writes at the very beginning, the former account I made, O Theophilus, he's writing to a, a man that he's writing this book for, the former account I made of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he, Jesus, was taken up. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, that means after his death on the cross, by many infallible, by many incontrovertible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, during 40 days. That's how we know. And Luke, who was a physician, a doctor, he was uh, very, very careful. He was a when it comes to facts, he's meticulous in that. And so he recorded that 40 days. And so after 40 days of these appearances of Jesus after his resurrection, the Savior was taken up into heaven. He ascended to the right hand of God. That is, he ascended to the position of sovereignty and power at the right hand of God. In Mark's gospel, his rendering of the ascension, he writes in Mark 16 and 19, so then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he, Jesus, was received up into heaven and sat down 
at the right hand of God. So we're going to be looking at the ascension in this message and the importance of it and what it means to us to this very day. In Luke's account, which we read in chapter 24, there are a number of things that we see, and we're going to look at them right away. The, the first thing that we read in Luke chapter 24, verse 50, it says, And he led them out. And Jesus led the disciples out. Here I see it speaks of direction. Direction from God's anointed one. You see, God's anointed one is another is another title, it's another phrase for the Christ or the Messiah, the Mashiach, the chosen one of God, the special one. Direction I see here from God's anointed one, and he led them out. Notice that the disciples didn't lead him out, Jesus led them out. And that's the way it should always be, friends. We should never try and go ahead of the Lord and say, well, Lord, this is the way to go. No. It's the Lord who says to us, this is the way, walk in it. He gives us direction. So he led them out. That's why Jesus said in John 10, verse 27, he said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. If you know the voice of Jesus, friend, then follow him. Follow his voice. If you are listening to other voices, then you will not be able to follow Jesus. And no one can say, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus, if you're listening to other voices. Voices of strangers, Jesus said in John chapter 10. Voices of strangers will lead you astray. And friend, don't listen to the voice of strangers. Don't think you can listen to another voice apart from Jesus. Even if it's the idea of, well, you know, what they're saying, it makes a lot of sense. It's good. I need to follow that. or. Or even, well, you know, they're well-known. And I know that they don't always preach everything the way it should, but, you know, they've got a great following. Or, well, they're on television. They've got their own show. And they've got a great following. Friends, listen. We're to follow the voice of Jesus. Listen to his voice and follow him. If you do that, my friend, you will never, never get into deep water because the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. John chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus also said, if anyone serves me, let them follow me. Let them follow me. In order to serve the Lord, say, I want to serve the Lord. Then you have to follow the Lord Jesus. No one can serve the Lord without following him. Jesus said, in fact, in Matthew chapter 6, no one can serve two masters. You say, oh, well, that's my master. I'll follow him for a while. That's my other master. Then I'll split my time between the two. It's impossible. You cannot do it. You cannot be loyal to both. You can only be loyal to one. And so if you want to say, well, I want to serve Jesus, then you must follow Jesus. Direction. I see from God's anointed one. First Peter 2, verse 21, the apostle Peter writes, to the believers, to this you were called. Here's what we're called to. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. We're, he left us an example. We're to follow his steps. Do you know what the example was? Jesus walks ahead. Not only does he walk with us, but here's the amazing thing. Jesus also walks ahead of us so that we're thinking, Lord, I'm a, I don't know what to do. I'm nervous. I don't know what the future holds. He's already been there. He's walked on ahead. He's prepared the way. He's the Lord God Almighty. So therefore, we can rest assured in him, knowing all is well. So firstly, I see direction from God's anointed one, and he led them out. But then furthermore, it says, and he led them out as far as Bethany. Here I see association. Association with God's appointed heirs. Notice that Jesus led them as far as Bethany. That's as far as the disciples were going to be going. Jesus was going to go further on, but not the disciples. 
and the word of God makes it clear. He led them as far as Bethany. And then they stopped. Association. Always remember this. The Lord will always take us as far as he deems fit. And anything after that, then we need to trust the Lord. In that, the Lord expects us to play our part. The Lord always does his. He'll always bring us to a point saying, I'll lead you as far as this. I'm helping you here, but the rest now, you must do it. I'll give you the strength to do it, but you've got to do it. And the Lord will help us as far as there. And so, association I see here, as far as Bethany, with God's appointed heirs. First John 1 and 3, the Bible says, Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what they experienced. They had association with the Son of God. Because as he led them out as far as Bethany, he was still there with them. They were associated with him. They were in fellowship with him. And uh, brothers and sisters, because we've put our trust in Jesus, we have association with the Son of God. In fact, the Bible says, truly, so this is the truth, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we fellowship with the Father because of His Son, Jesus. Hebrews 13 and 5, Jesus Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He led them as far as Bethany, but that's as far as He took them. He was not going to take them on any further, but He would, they'd be assured because He will never leave them nor forsake them, even though what was about to happen he would still have that association. They would still be associated with the Son of God. John chapter 20, we read uh, John's uh, record of the resurrection. And he takes it a little bit different in the sense of he adds something which the other three Gospels do not include. And that is, is that Mary Magdalene is, is left by herself in the garden. And she realizes and sees that the, there's no body there. There's no literal, physical body of Jesus. It's not there. And so she's standing crying. And she's there in the garden crying, and weeping. And the Bible tells us that a man approaches. And she turns around and says, and Mary, supposing, him to be, supposing it was the gardener, said to him, Sir, tell me where you've taken, they've taken my, my Lord's body. Please take it. And then who she thought was the gardener, then says, Mary. It was Jesus. No one else spoke Mary's name like Jesus. The moment Jesus spoke her name, her heart leapt for joy and said, Rabboni, which means great one, great master, great teacher. And she went and she hugged Jesus. She was so excited. She hugged the risen Christ. And uh, the Bible tells us, in fact, in John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to Mary, Do not cling to me. Do not hold on to me. Because I have not yet, notice this, I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, go to my brothers, the disciples, go to them, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and I am ascending to my God and your God. So don't claim me. There's, there's, there's lots of things to do yet, Mary. And so notice the importance laying up and stressed upon the ascension here. I am not yet ascended. This was very important, friends, because Jesus was not going to stay on earth. He was going back to the Father. So the ascension was vital in all of God's eternal plan. And so this is what he told Mary to do. So the he led them out as far as Bethany. As far as, but no further. Association with God's appointed heirs. Because he led them as far as there because they weren't going any further. They were staying. They were remaining as God's appointed heirs. Now what I'm left you with is that you're appointed to do the rest. What I've done has now set you up. And because you are my heirs, you're now going to do this. Heirs of the Father, joint heirs with the Son. 
And God made it all possible through His Son, Jesus, that now when Jesus was about to go, that they'll be able to carry on the work that He had given them to do in that mission. The third thing I see here, it says in verse 50, it says, And He led them out as far as Bethany, and He lifted up His hands and blessed them. Here I see consecration. Consecration of God's assigned disciples. Notice this, that Jesus didn't just take a mob with him to Bethany. He just didn't gather a few people up from the street and say, hey, do you want to come with me? Uh, I want you to come with me because I want you to see me. I'm about to ascend back to heaven. Come with me. No. This was for his assigned disciples. But also notice too, he didn't take all of his disciples. I'm talking about even the ones that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. At one point when Jesus appeared after the resurrection, there was at least 500 men at one time that Jesus appeared to them. So not this big crowd. Jesus took that little inner circle of disciples. That's the one he took, his assigned disciples. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Here I see consecration. Leviticus chapter 9, 22 in the Old Testament states, Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people, blessed them. Number 6, verses 24 to 26. This is known as the blessing of Aaron, who was the first high priest of Israel, or the Aaronic blessing. Aaron says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And in Leviticus 9, it says Aaron lifted his hand. Notice that. Aaron lifted his hand, one hand, to bless Israel. But you know with his disciples, the Bible says that Jesus lifted up his hands. He lifted both of them and blessed his disciples, both hands. And here we see, clearly, here we see the blessing from the high priesthood of God. And Jesus is God's high priest. And he was blessing them in a high priestly way. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. There are probably many things running through their minds at that point. Trying to take in everything that's happening. Listening carefully and intently to Jesus. No interruptions, just listening. After all, this was the resurrected Christ. He'd come back from the dead. Now he led them out as far as Bethany. What's going to happen next? He just got his inner circle here with him. What's going to happen next? But he lifted his hands. He blessed them. That must have been an amazing experience from him. And he blessed them. But then it goes on to say in verse 51, Now it came to pass that while Jesus blessed them, that he was parted from them. Interesting, isn't it? It came to pass that while he blessed them, he was parted from them. Here I see separation. Separation from God's ascending Son. So Jesus is in the middle of blessing, with his hands raised, in the middle of blessing these disciples. And the Bible says he was parted from them. He was taken from them. Separation came in. It reminded me a little bit of Elijah, that, that great prophet of Israel, known as the prophet of the Spirit in the Old, Old Testament. And how that Elijah was, he was soon to be taken to heaven. He wasn't going to die. But there was a, a man who was going to take his place as the next prophet of Israel. His name was Elisha. And uh, Elisha was serving Elijah at this point. And three, three times on different occasions, Elijah said in a row, Elijah said, well, listen, I've got to go to such and such a place. Elisha, you stay here. Elisha said, no, master, no, I'm not staying here. Wherever you're going, I'm going. That's it. And 
the next time, it happened three times. Elisha, I'm going to such and such a place, but you've got to stay here. And Elisha said, no, 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 no matter. He said, I'm going with you. I'm going with you. It's almost like, you know, the, you know, Lord, I will not go up unless you go with me. We want to be, I want to be with you, Lord. I don't, I don't want to stay away. I want to be with you every moment. And that's the heart we should have, friends, for Jesus. We should be want to be with him all the time. All the time. But we would have in the Old Testament. And so we read here that in 2 Kings 2, verse 11, then it happened that as Elijah and Elisha continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. So this great fiery chariot with horses came and actually came between and separated the two of them. Then it says, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Almost like, a, like an Old Testament precursor of ascending like that into heaven. Now it came to pass that while Jesus blessed them, that he was parted from them. Now Luke, who wrote the gospel that we're reading from today and we're doing the message from, as I've said earlier, he also wrote the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 9, Luke is also recording the ascension. And in verse 9 it says, Now when Jesus had spoken these things, while they, the disciples, watched, he, Jesus, was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. He was taken up. Simply means he ascended. He went up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Interestingly, when Jesus was taken in judgment, remember he went to the, the home of the high priest, and they took him there, and the priests were there as well. And the high priest said to him, Tell us if you are the Son of God. They were waiting for that because they wanted to charge him with blasphemy. Because when a person would say that, were to say that they're the Son of God, that was making themselves equal with God because they recognized that to be the Son of God, you are divine. And so they were setting a trap for Jesus. Tell us if you are the Son of God. And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man coming in great power and glory, sitting on a cloud. Another version, clouds. Interestingly, when Jesus ascended, the Bible says in Acts 1 and 9, a cloud received them out of their sight. The interesting thing too is, remember what? When he's coming back again, his second coming, and his people will be with him. How's he coming back? Coming back on a cloud in power and great glory. And so we see it's exactly what is going to happen. He went, he ascended on a cloud, he's coming back on a cloud. Clouds of great significance in the word of God. You know, friends, the, the wonderful thing is this. Just as Jesus Christ rose from the dead and became the first fruits, that means he became the first of his kind, the prototype of those who have died in Christ. Christ is also the prototype in his ascension of those who be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. See, Jesus Christ, in his resurrection, he rose from the dead. He came back to life again. Jesus said in John 10, no man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I've received from my Father. He rose again from the dead. That was his resurrection. But here's the thing. He didn't rise again from the dead to stay for the rest or forever upon earth. Not at that point. No, that wasn't God's plan. That was not what Jesus came to do. He came after the resurrection for a, a short time. But the resurrection didn't stop there because after the resurrection, there had to be the ascension because he had to return to his father. And we're going to look at that in a moment. And you see, whereas for the Christian believer, when it comes to us, we have the promise 
in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we shall rise to meet the Lord in the air. The Bible says we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The, Greek, Greek, the word there is rapture. We get it from the Latin for that phrase caught up. Greek is herpatso, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so for the believer, for Jesus, it was rise again from the dead. Then there was a time there he spent with the disciples. They ascended into heaven. But for the believer, it's resurrection and ascension all in one. Meet the Lord in the air. Praise God. And we're going to be with the Lord. And the wonderful thing is this. Paul adds this in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, and therefore, we shall always be with the Lord. There will be no separation. Unlike when Christ in his ascension with the disciples, the Bible says that while they watched, uh, sorry, that came to pass that while he blessed them, that Jesus was parted from them. He ascended to heaven. This is not going to happen for us. We're going to rise to meet the Lord. Because he's already going to be there in the air. And we're going to rise to meet him. And we'll never be parted again. That's it. We'll never be separated from Jesus again. And we shall always be with the Lord. The wonderful thing is, it says that while Jesus blessed the disciples, that he was parted from them. All right? So while he was still there, his hands were lifted up. He was blessing them. And then suddenly he was parted from them. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And as he was being taken from them, his hands were still raised. He was still blessing them. Here's the thing, friends. Whether Jesus was there with them physically or whether he was already on his way to heaven, both times, or even when he reached heaven, both times, the Lord is still able to bless them. Whether he was there right there at that point or whether they'd gone back to heaven, he was still going to bless his disciples. And brothers and sisters, today, we need to be encouraged and remember today that the Lord is in heaven. But thank God for his blessing. Thank God for his blessing. In Luke chapter 9, we read there, you've heard of the, the Mount of Transfiguration. And it is Matthew, Mark, and Luke who record this occasion. And when Jesus is transfigured, that his, his whole appearance is changed. It is in the Greek metamorphosed. Uh, that's where in, in the Greek, and just like a, a, from a larvae to a butterfly, there's different stages. And Jesus' stages became glorified. The Bible says his glory be, it became glistening. He was bright like one gospel writer says. He was brighter than the, the noonday sun. His glory was so amazing. He was so bright. And the Bible tells us that two men appeared with Jesus on the mountain, Elijah and Elisha. Now, Jesus had only taken, had only brought three disciples with him, uh, Peter, James, and John. And they were there. And they witnessed the whole thing. And Jesus then is standing, standing, speaking with, conversing with Elijah and Moses. And three of them are standing talking. Now, if it had been left that they didn't tell us, we weren't told what they were talking about, I'm sure a lot of people would have been, had their own ideas and maybe come up with things and certain theories, whatever. But the great news is our curiosity has been killed because the Bible tells us what they talked about on that mount. Because it says in Luke chapter 9, verses 30 and 31, that behold, two men talked with Jesus, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem and spoke of his decease. That's what, they, that's what the conversation amongst the three of them were. And the reason why we know this is because Peter, James, and John were listening. They were listening to them. They weren't part of the conversation. They were just watching this amazing event. And they were listening to the conversation. And the three of them spoke of Christ's decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now often, when we read that, we think, spoke of his decease, that means his death. Because often when we go to a, maybe a funeral parlor, to an undertaker, maybe because of a family, a, a family friend, a family's passed away member, 
or we go to a funeral service, very often the, the undertaker or someone else will refer to the deceased. They want to say it in a very uh, appropriate manner, uh, a very respectful manner. They'll speak about the one who is deceased. Because what we mean today is, of course, the one who has died. And so automatically in our English we think, well, that's what they spoke about. They spoke about his death. You see, friends, what the word decease is there in the Greek is the word exodos. In the English is our word exodus. In fact, that's the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. And so in the Greek, the word exodus literally means departure. Think about the book of Exodus, the departure of the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. It means departure. And so Jesus, with Moses and Elijah, they spoke about Christ's departure. Not just his death. You see, this word not only speaks of his death that they spoke about, it, but it speaks of his death, resurrection, and ascension. Because notice what it says, which Jesus was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Because his death was there, the, he's going to rise from the dead in a grave by, by, right by Jerusalem there, and from just outside Jerusalem, was go, also going to, from the, the environs of Jerusalem, was going to ascend back to his father. But he was going to accomplish, this was all going to be accomplished, all part of God's plan. He would rise back to heaven. Separation from God's ascending son. Now it came to pass that while he blessed them, he was parted from them. Let me tell you, friend, once again, even though Jesus was parted from them and went back to heaven, Jesus never left them nor forsook them. And we're going to look at a little bit like this again. We're going to leave it there for today. But friends, thank you for listening today. God bless you. Let me pray with you right now. Dear Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for your son Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, rose again for our justification, and ascended back to heaven, to the right hand of God. And dear Lord, we thank you for this amazing plan of salvation for us. And we thank you, Lord, that Jesus loved us so much. Father, you loved us so much that Jesus was willing to come and to give his life a ransom for many. Dear Lord, I pray for those listening today. Pray, Lord, first of all, for those who are listening who do not know you, that, Lord, they'll put their trust in you. They'll give their life to you and say, Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to listen to your voice. Please forgive me all my sins. Come into my life. I will follow you and I receive your gift of eternal life. Lord, for your people today who are listening, may we seek once again to get closer to you, Lord. As it were, to get past and cut away all the stuff in this life which is of really no consequence in our walk with you. Those things which are obstacles to us. I pray that, Lord, that we will remove them so that we will have a closer walk with you, Lord, and a more intimate relationship. Father, here as we pray, until we meet together in this way again, until you come, in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Have a wonderful week. The Lord bless you. Today we are having communion. Communion is for God's people, those who follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And of course, we're doing this to obey the command that Jesus gave us. We read 1 Corinthians 11, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you do proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of the cup in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to themselves. But let a person examine themselves, and so let them eat of that bread and drink of that cup. The Lord's communion, the Lord's table, is for the Lord's people. But even then, the Word of God instructs us very, very clearly that before we partake, uh, even before we even, even come to the house of God even at times, that we examine personally ourselves. And so upon that, we make sure that there's nothing, nothing clear between us and the Lord, no, nothing blatantly clear which is stopping our fellowship the sense of us stopping the blessing of God in our lives, that we're not knowingly sinning against the Lord and doing wrong. So it's important that we do examine ourselves, friend. And upon that examination, then we partake to the glory of Jesus. So friends, let's come to communion today. Let's partake, whether it's bread or a little biscuit, It's all it is, but it's what it represents. It's what it symbolizes. It's the broken body of Jesus. All our sins were laid upon him. He suffered in our place for our sins. He suffered the pain and agony of our sins. Let's partake in the name of Jesus. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this. Drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Thank you Lord for your victorious death at the cross. Thank you, Lord, you cried, it is finished. There's nothing more to be done. You did it all. Thank you, Lord, for taking our place. Thank you, Lord, your death is our death. Your victory is our victory. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. Help us to continue to live in the light of what you've done for your people. What you've done for all those yet who will call upon you to be the Lord and Savior. Pray, O oh God, help us to live for you every day until you come for us or call us home before. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. God bless you.